Well, today we are not coming to you from the exchange, but we are talking to one of the top CEOs who is leading one of the largest companies by market size. It's actually 10 times the size of the next 10th stock that follows this company. You might want to guess which company this is. Well, Safaricom. We shall be speaking to Bob Colimo, the CEO of Safaricom, and uh, we are coming to you from his residence in the upmarket Nairobi. Thank you, Bob, for hosting us. Welcome, welcome. I can't shake your hand. Oh, I remember. <laughs> Good to see you. No, no it's a pleasure. It's Keeping a pleasure. well? I'm well. All, All right. Well, thanks. And uh, we look forward to an exciting interview. Please uh, Let's hope so. <laughs> show us the way. Come this way. All right. Let's take a quick look at his profile. Bob is the CEO of Safaricom Limited, a position he held since 1st November 2010. Previously, he has worked in the United Kingdom, Japan and South Africa in a number of senior executive roles in marketing, purchasing, retail, governance and corporate affairs. He has more than 30 years of commercial experience working in senior executive roles in the telecommunications sector. Bob serves on the board of Acumen, the United Nations Global Compact Board, and is a member of the B-Team, a not-for-profit initiative formed by a global group of business leaders to catalyze a better way of doing business for the well-being of the planet. He also serves on the Kenya Vision 2030 Board, is a founder trustee in the National Road Safety Trust and chairman of the team's board. He has recently served on UN Commission on Life-Saving Commodities for Women and Children. Thank you so much, Bob, for making time for us. It's a pleasure. Great to see you. Thank you. Should I say Happy New Year, Happy New Month? I think you can still say Happy New Year because we're just into February now. All right. And uh, Bob, uh, such an honor to be in your residence. And uh, of course, uh, one of the big conversations currently happening is Fuleza. <laughs> I mean, how innovative are you in terms of meeting the market needs? Looking at how this product has performed so far, I understand uh, you've clocked about six billion in terms of since you started it? You know, it's the power of the partnership. Uh, we, we, we didn't do this on our own. We can't take full credit for this. Um, so we've been doing this in partnership with our friends at KCB and uh, CBA, a long-term relationship. And uh, we've been working on this thing now for about two years. Uh, and I think between us, we, we have a pretty good understanding of what the customer wants. A lot of people say, you know, you're encouraging people to get into more debt. Uh, well, usually these are people who don't really understand what this product is. You talked about six billion shillings in about 30 days, sure. which is a lot of money. That's a lot. Uh, but you know, the average repayment is in uh, it's about 2.8 days. So people really are using this um, as an overdraft facility to help them complete a transaction when they just don't have enough cash in the wallet. And as soon as you put money into M-Pesa, then it pays off the debt. So what was behind the thinking around this product? We looked at a lot of customers who were um, usually what we call the, the, the hustler segment, who had attempted to make a, a transaction, didn't complete it because of lack of funds, but then completed that transaction within two days. And so we saw, obviously, these people are not people who want to borrow money. It's just people who don't have the funds in their M-Pesa account right now. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they get the opportunity to load the account, then they load it. Mm -hmm. And so it was that insight which, uh, which led to the product. All right. And Bob, uh, over time, M-Pesa has emerged as uh, the crown in the jewel, the flagship sort of of the company so far. But at the end of it all, we also have the data business, which is also proving to be a force to reckon with. Um, data has is, is definitely got a lot of growth left in it. Um, the two big drivers are M-Pesa and, and data usage. And as we get more and more smartphone penetration, more and more people will want to use data. And they're using it for a range of things, you know, starting with social media use. But also, you, you know, you, you can now use it for things like e-commerce. So mm. you can get onto the Masoko site. Oh, yeah. and, and all of that is, is, is data usage. So we're seeing the growth of data. Today, average consumption is about 800 
850 MBs per month. Uh, and we see that over the next few years growing into being measured in GB. So, you know, the average, I think, will be three, four, five GBs a month. All right. And uh, one of the trends we are seeing also, Bob, is uh, home internet, which is yeah. also an untapped market, if I would say so. Mm -hmm. It was predominantly occupied by one of the competitors in the industry. Mm -hmm who are not having a really good time in the market so far. Mm. And uh, are you seeing a huge opportunity, especially with the coming up of new estates, new neighborhoods across Nairobi, across the country in totality? Yeah, I, again, you know, what's, what's the insight which is driving this is um, what people used to abuse me for a lot uh, a few years ago, where they wanted unlimited internet. Mm. Uh, and I understand why they wanted unlimited internet, but if you try to do that on using a mobile phone, it's, it's massively expensive. Um, and so we, we said, well, how do we deliver unlimited internet? And the, the best way of doing that is by having fiber to the home. I mean, this home has fiber, so whenever I want to access the internet, I just go on, I don't pay any extra for it. I pay my monthly fees. Mm. Um, so it was that unlimited internet, but then we de developed some further insights into it to say uh, people wanted security. Um, so security cameras, they want to see what's going on in their home and they're at work and stuff like that. Mm. So that was a, a, a surprising piece of insight which came out. Uh, and of course, people want content. We're still working on the content piece. All right. And uh, still staying with this home fiber, it's, it's quite fascinating for me because I'm actually one of your customers. I've also seen uh, the rates that we've been paying compared to what we paid uh, late last year coming into the new year. The rates were revised. And uh, personally, I felt uh, it was quite a bit um, unusual knowing that uh, your business has been expanding. I don't know, what, what is your message to consumers out there who feel the rates should be lower than what we pay currently? Um, I, I would point you to Treasury mm -hmm. um, because this was the imposition of the new taxes, All right. which previously you know, didn't apply to home internet. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so it's uh, Mr. Henry Rotich <laughs> that you need to go point a finger at. That's a smart one. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I understand why government needs to spread its, uh, its tax mm. net um, because, you know, really the numbers of people who are paying tax in the country does not reflect the number of people who are working. So government has this big challenge. Uh, we always object when taxes uh, are pointed at our industry, whether it's on, on voice, it's on mobile money, or in this case, it's on data and fiber to the home. Okay. And uh, finally, on the data business, uh, Bob, um, with, with this new emerging neighborhoods, uh, are we likely to see a drop in the charge per month, especially now that you'll have more economies of scale? Um, the, the prices continue to come down. So if you look at the prices that people average price per, and I'm talking mobile here, but mm -hmm. the same would apply to... Uh, to fix. If you look at the average price, it's actually declined by about 30% in the past year, and that will continue to come down. I, I would hope that we would start to make this more and more affordable for lower and lower income people, because, you know, access to the internet is a kind of a basic right that people should sure. be able to exercise. Speaking about uh, basic rights, uh, Safaricom recently celebrated uh, its 18 years yeah. of transforming the way Kenyans live, interact, and do business. And uh, what are some of the milestones that, when you look back with hindsight, you say, wow, we made it? <laughs> um, well, between Michael and I, we look back and we look back at some of the, the, the big problems that, that we've had. Yeah. Uh, and usually those problems are around network outages. So I've had my fair share of network outages, mm -hmm. either with M-Pesa or mm -hmm. with the network going down. Michael has had the same. So they're on the, on the, the negative side. Um, there are a ton of positive things. Uh, you know, we were not the first mobile operator in the country. We were not given the first license. We were the second. Uh, and, um, you know, we've kind of grown and Kenya has grown with us, our customer base has grown with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and PESA is, is the one which you know, comes up time and time again. Uh, investing in 3G is something which we did when no one else wanted to do it. I remember I was sitting on the board and Michael was the CEO at the time, and um, the business case did not stack up. But Michael said, you know, I, th I think 
it's the right thing to do. Similarly, when we launched 4G, yeah. you know, a lot of people were saying, I don't think Kenya is ready for 4G, but, but we went ahead. And so we've always had the confidence in the country, always had the confidence in the market mm -hmm. when other people didn't. The result of that is that we have ended up being the largest player in the market because we still continue to invest 35 billion, 36 billion every year, which no one else does. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you will end up with the biggest network you will end up with the, the highest quality network, and you will therefore end up with the largest numbers of customers. It's not, it's not a surprise. Sure. And of course, this baffles many because now you earn the tag of being a dominant player. Yeah, and um, we, we are, if you define dominance the way we define dominance, then we are a dominant player. We, sure. you know, we don't have a, an issue with that. No apologies uh, at all. Oh, well, no, I, mean, I, I, can't, I, I can't apologize that we have continued to invest in, uh, in the sector. Sure. You know, so you invest in the sector and you get a return for it. Mm -hmm. I, look, I look back on my early days here where people were reducing the prices to uh, an un but I, at the time I called it an unsustainable mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And I, it was unsustainable because if that's the price you charge, you will not make a profit and you will not be able to invest. And if you don't invest, you will lose market share. Uh -huh. And so I, I can't, I can't apologize for growing the, the company the way I've grown it, the, the way we've grown the reach of the company, the way we've constantly innovated. Um, so, you know, wh why would you apologize for that? What I would apologize for, if we were guilty of it, is an abuse of that dominance. Mm. And, you know, there's been no evidence that we have abused the dominance. There are time, mm. times when, for example, the competition authority has said, you need to remove the exclusivity on your Mpesa agents. Sure. And we said, fine. Mm. And, and we did. Uh, so, you know, whenever we've been tackled on things, we've, we've responded positively to it. All right. And uh, Bob, uh, link, linking this uh, response you've just given me, um, the, the growth of M-Pesa Global, from where you sit, what does it mean for the company? Um, well, you know, M-Pesa has been successful in Kenya and, and you know kind of like everybody uses it mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to send money overseas or you want to get money from overseas it's a it's a bit of a schlep you know it, mm. it, it's it's expensive sure and so we've partnered with um, with PayPal for example so mm -hmm. if you want to buy I mean, a lot of people don't use PayPal because they either don't have a credit card or they definitely don't want to put their credit card there because they don't they don't trust it um, so you can pay through PayPal using M-Pesa. We uh, have worked for a very long time with Western Union where you can send money from Western Union to here. I remember those days. Yeah, you remember it was a, it was a long time ago, when I first started actually. Mm. Um, now you can send money from Kenya to a Western Union point overseas and a lot of people have got their kids or friends or family mm. that they need to send money for. I mean, a lot of my friends who's children are being educated overseas, yeah. um, it's, a, it's, it's a way to, to, to transfer the, the cash. Um, we've got some other things that we'll be announcing over the course of the next, uh, next few weeks in this M-Pesa global space, how we will partner with other people to, um, to use M-Pesa for doing other things, for paying for other things All right. outside of just in Kenya. I actually have uh, two friends of mine who live, uh, one is in Atlanta, the other one is in New York. And we're in a, sort of a group where we uh, uh, try to do investments. Mm -hmm. And I'm the treasurer, so they, they actually use the service. It's actually called Wave. Yeah. So w Wave has been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first encountered it, um, it, it was in, um, in Los Angeles, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I was there for um, <clears throat> a Milken Institute summit with some fellow Kenyans uh, and I met some Kenyans in the diaspora and they were so enthusiastic about it because yeah. here was, um, was a company that really understood and you know Wave is a small company it's not, it's not, it's not huge. That's right? what I realized. It's a very small company yeah. but really understood the market and, mm. and that's you know they're the kind of partners that we really like working with. They understood the diaspora market better than anybody else mm -hmm. and moved that money much more efficiently. All right. And uh, in terms of diaspora remittances, um, mm -hmm. what's fueling this? I'm not sure what's I'm not sure what's fueling uh, fueling the the remittances back from mm -hmm. 
uh, from overseas. But I, I do know that Kenyans, and I meet many of them whenever I travel, including when I was off in um, medical treatment, uh, there are many Kenyans who are really doing very successful things mm. in, uh, in, in wherever they might be, whether it's the United States or it's in Europe. Yeah. Um, and because Kenya is, um, <clears throat> Kenyans by and large, you know, we, we, we kind of care about our communities. Um, and this is something which is so frequently missed because we fixate on the thieves and the vagabonds. You know, mm -hmm. we fixate on the people who are corrupt and who rob the poor blind, you know. Um, and we forget that Kenyans really care about their community. Uh, and I think this is what you're seeing with this remittances back. Also, people want to invest back in the country. Sure. Uh, but, you know, if, if to follow through on this, this whole Kenyans caring about the community, I mean, this is what we're, uh, we're trying to explore with the, our, our current campaign of Dr. Zetu, where we're, we recognize that Kenyans want to fix their mm -hmm. problems in their society, in their communities, small communities. And we, we recognize the role that we can play in helping them. And, and that's what that's, that's about.